Lord, as we come before you this morning uh, for Sunday school and for the Bible study, I just ask uh, an anointing on David as he um, brings a message today. Lord, I just pray that your will would be accomplished and that your name would be glorified because of the teaching that we receive. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. And may the Holy Spirit be our teacher in this Bible study. Um, if I was busy this morning, is, this is interesting because uh, what we do as Christians who are in the Word of God plowing is we're seeing what's happening around the world, you know, and um, we're taking... Communism hates competition. Yeah. Well, I, I found out something about... I already knew this about Taiwan, but it really put a, a focus on it for me uh, just in the last few days, is that there is a microchip company there bar none best in the world and this thing is called um uh it forbes wrote an article about it uh it's a, it's called um i just want to mention this before i start the revelation study because it's worth noting um it's called tsmc these microchips are so tiny they're like little i mean smaller than a grain of rice we're talking tiny 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 and very powerful one of these units that they have to create these chips, I guess, cost $300 million, and they have multiple of them. So China wants this technology really, really bad. They want it because it's the only technology available in the world. And you know what, it, you know what that sums up? That's Mark of the Beast stuff right there. And yeah, and we know that, we know that China um, plays a, a role in the Book of Revelation. They're, they're a part of a coalition um, called the Kings of the East. And, you know, when we look at uh, end times um, Bible prophecy and scriptures like in Ezekiel and some other areas of the Bible like Revelation, there's nations that uh, form alliances together. And we know about the European Union having a 10-nation confederacy that the Antichrist is going to have. Then the Chinese have theirs and the Russians have theirs. And it's all in it's all in scripture, you know. So I just kind of wanted to mention that, and then also that um, Hamas is on its last legs right now with Rafah. That's like their last stronghold, and Israel is ignoring the warnings of the International Criminal Court and all of that. You know, they're they're going in to take them out. To take them out. Yeah, and they've been threatened and everything that they're going to be arrested. It's in Germany's threatening them, and it's, I've never seen anything like that before. But the Bible's not silent about it. I don't have time to go into all that today, but I did want to just mention that really quick, that that stuff is going on. Um, and then I want to take you to um, a passage of Scripture here. This is not in Revelation, but it's going to set the table for Revelation. Uh, chapter uh, 2 and verse 8. So let me get on over there really fast here. This is... Um, so I'm in, okay, I'm going to read two passages of scripture, which is going to launch Revelation 2.8, okay? This was, this is Psalm 119, 105, and what I like to do in Bible studies, it's not, I don't call it rabbit trailing. I call it sound doctrine. I call it like taking scripture and, and other scripture and trying to make it go like this, where it fits, because that's what we want to do. We want to have scripture confirm scripture. And Psalm 19, 105 says this, it says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. The word of God is a lamp for our feet and a light for our path, okay? Then Jesus goes on to confirm it in Matthew chapter um, 6, verses 22 and 23. I'm going to read this really quick and then we'll get on over to Revelation because it does have something to do with what I want to talk about the letters of the churches. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, the whole body shall be full of light. And if thy eye be evil, the whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? And so we saw like in Revelation chapter 1 that there is um, in where Jesus was was standing and John saw him, he had those lamp stands, right? And, and the stars in his hand. And he's walking in the midst of the of the lamps. And, and you know, he's watching the church. 
And, and whether the candlestick is in a church or it's not there, he's, he's like this. He's looking at every single one of those churches like this. Whether the lamps, whether the candlestick is there or not. That's what we're getting out of these letters, is that he is looking at every single one of the churches. And so he's watching what we're doing, you know, um, whether good or bad. And so it's an evaluation. The letters are an evaluation of how the churches are doing, and I believe that's very relevant today. What do you guys think? Am I right? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. And I'm open for comments, guys. This is, this is Bible study stuff, so, I mean... I'm completely down with that. Well, it's interesting that this verse in my translation, 2.8, says, write to the letter to the angel of the church. Why would you write a letter to an angel? The, it seems like Jesus is putting these angels, they have a very important job. He wants to make sure they know what they're supposed to be doing. Yeah. And no uncertain terms. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a good point, Sandy. In fact, uh, I had a Bible study online the other day at the house, and I was talking about, and I don't want a rabbit trail, but I do want to follow up with what you said, that there's angels over these churches, okay, that are watching over them. Well, what's interesting is that Satan is doing the same thing with his territories, and this in Ezekiel 38 that I was in the other day, God calls out this prince called God. Is that a, is that a, a principality? I think it is. I think, I, I mean, obviously principalities control people. They control leaders. And so, yes, there's a message for a, a particular person in charge of a country, but it's, there's a spirit over that thing too, over that nation. So I, that's a good point to bring up. So there's like, this is the Ephesians chapter six stuff with spiritual warfare. It's deep, you know, it's deep. Um, but what I'll do, what I'm going to do here is, here, here's where I'll go. I'll go ahead and get on over to Revelation chapter uh, chapter 2, and let's look at, I'm going to start in verse 8. Give me one second here. Thanks for your patience. Okay. I think it's verse 8. Let's see. Yes. Yeah. Okay. This is the Smyrna church. Um, we're going to move along. Uh, maybe we'll get through a couple of churches to three. We'll see how it goes. Um, we talked about Ephesians. The Ephesians church was a uh, church that was um, working and working and working, but for some reason they didn't have any more love. They started with love, and then all of a sudden they didn't have love anymore. And Jesus kind of well, they lost their first. Love. They lost their first love, you know. And um, I. I understand when people say that, you know, that was their love for Jesus that they lost. But I do believe that when you have the love of Jesus, you're supposed to love your neighbor too. Yeah. And so it kind of goes all downhill. If you lose your love for the Lord, then you don't love your neighbor anymore. You don't, it's just, a, it's just a daily grind like a business and you're just running it like a business. And so they became focused on ritual and going through the motions and just, doing things in the same way all the time instead of asking the Holy Spirit how to do things. Amen. I mean, do you guys see any of that today? Do you see the, the, the mm -hmm. you know, rituals? Like, um, I don't know what the churches are like in the area around here today. I don't have a bone to pick with anybody, but like I've been to them in the past and it's just, I don't know, it's just like a ritual and People are nice at church. I've met some nice people at some of the churches around here, but like, I don't know. It just seems like it's ritual, and I don't feel the Holy Spirit. I haven't. Maybe I would if I went over to some of the other ones today. I don't know. But I'm just saying, like, since we have had um, a do over here, I, I feel the Lord here with us. I really do, and it's it's amazing, and and that's why I'm just encouraged to do do these Bible studies and help support the pastor and the other deacons. And the Holy Spirit has been ignored in the churches. And it's no different than when Jesus was walking on earth and the, and the Pharisees, or the leaders of the synagogue, were ignoring him. And every time that his name would come up, they'd just rebuke it and say, oh, no, he's a Beelzebub or something like that. The key to life in a church 
is the Holy Spirit. And if we don't have the Holy Spirit in the church, we don't have life. We just have ritual. And then it comes down to evaluation because there's a lot of people that know that and they don't care. They're going to run that building the way they want to and it doesn't matter if they're doing it right or not. Like they, It's like a business. And I think that's what happened to the Ephesians church, right? They just fell into some type of a thing where, <clears throat> you know, they weren't, they didn't do, they didn't do their work with love. And so I feel like that was the repentance call for them was, you know, finding your first love again. And we compared that last week with being born again. Like when I got born again, I remember when my mom got saved, she told me that story when she was like a teenager and she said it was an amazing experience to get saved like it I don't know she's 15 or 16 years old and she tried sharing Jesus with people at school and they laughed at her and she <laughs> she didn't understand why they thought it was funny or making fun of her because she thought it was amazing yeah. that's that that first love you know that that was there um the Smyrna church has a different thing going on um I'll read some scripture here and then um I'll make a, a statement about it and then you guys tell me what you think and unto the angel of the church of Smyrna write, These things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them that say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Fear none of these things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. <clears throat> um, Smyrna was a church that was uh, suffering physical and verbal persecution for their faith, and what I was reading about that church, uh, let me see if I can bring this up really fast. Um, now, if you guys have thoughts, please just jump in. Um, Christians in developed countries today think little about being persecuted for their faith, but there are churches in the world where oppression is a daily reality such was the case for the ancient church of Smyrna. Refusing to worship pagan gods or the Roman emperors, they experienced pressure, poverty, and persecution. Two of the seven churches received no rebuke from Jesus, and Smyrna was one of those churches. Surrounded by um, one of them, the ancient world's most beautiful cities, this congregation experienced the ugliness of oppression Christ's words to that church can prepare all believers for what might come. <clears throat> and there's a call to be fearless. So, you know, we see that a lot today about how people don't like the word of God message. And I think that's where the compromise comes into a lot of the churches is that anybody that's trying to preach the word of God uncompromised gets threats or even from their own congregation and stuff like that. But... The call is to be fearless here no matter what, whether half of your congregation walks out or they don't or whatever, but you can't you can't you can't compromise the word of God ever. It doesn't matter. I mean if you're the only guy left that's not compromising, then you know the Lord will honor that. You have to you have to you have to give the word of God uncompromised. So Smyrna was um, uh, a church that was called to be faithful and to be fearless. Um Okay, next we're going to go over to um, a verse in chapter 2. Let's go to um, okay, verse 12. This is Pergamos. And to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things saith he which hath a sharp sword with two edges. The, by, the word of God is called a sharp two-edged sword, by the way. I know thy works where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seed is. And thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith, even in those days where an Antipas was my faithful martyr. I think Polycarp was martyred there too, if I'm not mistaken. Mm. Yeah, 
who was slain among you where Satan dwelleth. Um, I'm going to do a full stop there for a second. I'm going to read verse 14. But isn't it interesting that the Bible tells us where Satan dwells? It's, it's this place, it's a location over in Turkey. I can't pull a map up right now. But this Pergamos was located in, a, in an area of Turkey. And, um, and Jesus says this is where Satan's seat is. Kind of interesting. Are they going to play a role in the future, uh, uh, Turkey? You know? I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying that's where the Antichrist comes from, but, uh, but Satan's seat is obviously there, and I don't, don't think If that. you go to Pergamos on Google Maps, you'll find a big hill outside the city with a crescent moon and a star on it. Oh, oh we know. Oh, yeah. 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 Did he? Yeah, that platform. Wow. Obama and, Hitler. and also Obama. Yep, they took it there for, for Obama's inauguration. He assembled that uh, model of that uh, platform for his inauguration. There is absolutely no question in my mind that <clears throat> Islam is going to play a big role in the time of Jacob's trouble. Mm -hmm. <laughs> How big that role is, we can all talk about it, but you know, it's it's right there in our face. And Obviously, Islam is, uh, we know who's controlling Islam. <clears throat> so, um, Doris, you look like you were going to say something. Did you have something to add to Doris? You okay? Okay. Um, so that's something to make note of in Scripture where Satan's seat is located. And I wouldn't assume that would change. I'm pretty sure it's going to stay right where it is. And So something significant is going to happen. I do know the Ten Nation Confederacy that attacks Israel in the future. Turkey is one of those <clears throat> nations that form the alliance with Russia. Um, so they're, they're part of it. Germany is part of it. And there's other nations that are part of that Ten Nation Confederacy. And so I think, I mean, we're going to get to the rest of this in a second, but just inserting that where Satan's seat is, it seems to me that these Abraham Accords, uh, I think this is the last accord that we're gonna see before everything starts going down, is that these Abraham Accords are in place and there's peace in Israel because right now they're not, they're having war. So there's no peace right now. There's no peace and safety at the moment. Yeah, but when the peace does happen, maybe these Abraham Accords are have taken root with a, maybe a new president, US president, you know, might have got, gotten this done. And um, they're protesting, Saudi Arabia and them, these nations will be protesting that 10 nation confederacy that attacks Israel. Because of these Abraham Accords in place, there's gonna be a lot of wealth there when these peace accords are implemented. Like lots of wealth in Ezekiel 38, it makes it really clear that there is wealth going on and they want that wealth, that 10 nation confederacy with Russia, they want it. And Turkey's involved, so that's why I'm rabbit trailing on this a little bit is because Satan's seat is in this location with Islam, with Islam. So, you guys okay? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Verse 14, so here is, um, here's the <laughs> honest grade though, but I have a few things against thee. Um, give me one second here. Hey David, next week maybe if you could get a map of the area and we'll put it on the big screen. Absolutely. Help give us context. I would love to do that. I, I think sometimes visuals are good for Bible studies so that you, you can, like visuals are just very good for remembering and seeing. So I would love to put that together with you, Sandy. Mm -hmm. um, Don, Don had a, a big map. You know, the shape of the cubes. Sure. Really? Sometimes, yeah, I, was, I didn't know. Yeah, I mean, some, like I said, sometimes these maps and illustrations are really good. Yeah. Um, but this 10 nation, what's really fascinating to me, when we start getting deeper into the book of Revelation, we're going to see these alliances, you know, with, with the kings of the East. The uh, United Nations is going to have one. And, um, you know, to me, I'm looking at that and I see that these these nations that get together, they're not all going to agree with the Antichrist. China's not going to go. I know that everybody's supposed to receive a mark um, eventually, but it's like China has its own ideas and its own agendas, you know, that have nothing to do with the Antichrist. So just interesting to think about. Um, but I have a few things against the Pergamus, okay, because thou hast... 
there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak, and Pastor taught about uh, Balaam last week, last Sunday. By the way, social media, I want to encourage everybody to, um, I'm going to post this on our Stites Baptist Church pages. So if you want more Bible studies with Pastor's message, um, I encourage you to subscribe over there because they're going to be really good. We're, we're going to be tying a lot of these things in together. Balaam is mentioned here in, in the letter to these churches. There's several problems with these churches. One of them is Balaam, another one is Jezebel, and then the Nicolaitans. He calls these out, and so there's like there are these spirits that are attached to these churches. So we're going to look at what the problem with the spirit of Balaam was with Pergamos. Um, okay, one second here, let me back up. Um, this is who taught Balak, okay, in verse 14, to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication. <clears throat> so what, what, what Balaam was able to successfully do, which got himself killed, by the way, um, was he taught Israel's enemies how to intermarry and, and have relations with their pagan um, their pagan women. Mm -hmm. So the pagan women went and married the Israeli men and, and caused them to fall with the fornication. I don't know if it was, you want to call it marriage, but let's just say fornication here it says. Um, so the same thing's going on with this Pergamus church. And the sacrificing unto idols... That's that's just idolatry business. That's just another doctrine that's gotten into the church. To me, that's what that looks like to me is other doctrines getting in and corrupting the church. Um, Repent or else I will come unto thee quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Um, to me, well, in Revelation 19, that's what's going to happen there at the second coming. So it's almost like these people that are in this church, this Pergamus church, or the spirit of the Pergamus church, I understand this all happened like 2,000 years ago, but it all comes around. There's people in church today that aren't saved. There's people that, in church that aren't Christians. It's kind of a weird thing to say. You would think that everybody would be saved in a church, but they're not. And the Lord's calling them out to repent, you know, or else they're going to get left behind and they're going to have to go through the seven-year tribulation and see all of this if they live that long. Um, witches and Satanists in churches. It's now to cause trouble. It's great. I have never seen anything like this in my, my whole life. Not not where Satanists are being welcomed into church. Um, they're not known. They're agents, provocateurs. And they're self yeah, like... like uh, inviting Taylor Swift and all that and you know um, by the way not to rabbit trail or anything but there's this 18 year old kid he's got a YouTube channel and I mean this is really encouraging he is pretty much on his own I think he belongs to a church but he's a Christian kid and he's evangelizing in Los Angeles and he's going to all those places where we wouldn't want to go homeless drug addicts Satanists and he's fearless and I'm like wow this is encouraging to me to see somebody that young doing that yeah. on fire for God, you know? Um, yeah, and I'll, I'll give you guys his, guys his channel. Link on the Facebook page. I'll do that. Yeah, yeah I'll do that. But it, it's really encouraging because I love to see younger people just on fire for God. It's, you know, we're not the only ones, right? This new generation that's coming up is, they're doing things that, I mean, people would be too afraid to do in a church and he's out there doing it and he's giving food to the homeless he's, he's being you know showing that love right that the uh, Ephesians lost <laughs> um, okay so um, in verse 17 the same message he that hath an ear let him hear with the spirit saith unto the churches to him that overcometh I will give to eat of the hidden manna and will give him a white stone uh, in the stone, a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. That's such a cool promise, having a new name in heaven. You know, isn't that going to be amazing what, what our new name is going to be? Yeah. Don't even know, but it's, wow, that's a mystery, you know? That's really exciting. And you know what the other exciting thing is before I read the 
the next one here, is how close we are to the rapture. Like, we are close, guys. I mean, I'm not telling you today, tomorrow, I don't know, but I'm watching these things, and it's going to happen in this generation, and um, I'm praying that everybody in this congregation, hope some, some of you out there too, are alive to see it, alive and remain, we're going to be caught up in the air. That is going to be an incredible moment. Can't even imagine what that's going to be like. But am I excited about it? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, let's go to Thyatira. And the angel of the church of Thyatira write, These things saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. I know thy works and charity and service and faith and thy patience and thy works, the last to be more than the first. So he's saying, you know, you're working harder. Um, your work is, is probably number one, and then faith and patience are taking a second seat to that. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, here we go, which call herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my service to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. And I will kill her children with death, and all the churches, all the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth the reigns and hearts, and I will give unto every one of you according to your works. That's what I'm saying about the Lord walking in the midst of the lampstands, looking at all the churches. Um, isn't it interesting that he talks about Jezebel like she's alive? And Jezebel has been dead since Ahab. Ahab's wife died, fell off of the yeah. that balcony, right? They threw her off of the balcony. Was that Jehu that did that? Yeah. So isn't it an interesting statement that he calls Jezebel out here? Yeah, I've heard a lot of teachings about Jezebel. Okay. And the definitions are so varied. Mm -hmm. But this really defines how that spirit operates. Okay. And we really should not go beyond the, these parameters. I, I've heard everything from it's a woman who gossips to women who usurp the authority of men and every other imaginable thing. But I think we have to be careful that we don't give her too much credit. What parameters would you use, Joe, in this? The ones that are written here. Okay, okay. I agree with that. You know, I mean, women can get triggered by that Jezebel thing, but you know us men, we don't like being called Balaam either. <laughs> You know, Balaam was not a nice guy. Go ahead, Jill. Well, that spirit can be either man or woman. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. It, it, uh, well, with this LGBTQ moment, that's true. <laughs> you know, well, I mean, there's men named Jezebel running around. It's, it's an influence. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. Influence in a man or a woman. I think when I look at that, I look at Jezebel as a, a spirit that who usurps authority, right? I mean, to me, usurps authority because that Jezebel was always manipulating Ahab, her husband, all the time. And he was, wasn't he an Israeli and he and she was a foreigner, right? He, he married her from another, I think it was Egypt. Am I correct? I think she is an Egyptian and he brought her in. Just remember, Jezebel, the Jezebel spirit is an agent of Satan. And if you think like that, then it's appropriate for male or female to be affected by that. And the, her whole purpose is to seduce the church. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I totally agree with that. It's an evil spirit, and that's to me is the proper context anyway. So, um, but I, I do see, I do see a lot of things happening in our churches today that um, have that spirit of Jezebel attached to it like Balaam, and I could care less about gender, marking this gender and that gender with it, you know, I'm just gonna call out what I see. Um, if it's Balaam, the spirit of Balaam is all about the money, right? 
And what does, the, what does the Jezebel say? Let's read it again here about Jezebel. Let me back up a minute. That's what we should do, right, Joe, is go through Scripture and, and call it out. Right. So... Start uh, in verse 20. Okay. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman, Jezebel, which call herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. Um, I do see that in churches. I, I have seen, I have seen prophetesses make prophecies that don't come true, and it's not. And this says she is teaching and seducing my spirits to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. It's it's very specific. Yeah, it is. Well, I can find I can find that in 2024. Yes, when we read about her in the Old Testament, she does all these terrible things with her husband, and that's that's true. But when we're talking here about this spirit within this church, yeah. this is what how she is affecting this. This yeah. spirit is affecting this church. She calls herself a prophetess herself. Yes. You know, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit yes. fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. So there's no scripture involved in what this prophetess is teaching people in the church. Well, it's just all really about idolatry and worshiping false gods. It's not necessarily, fornication isn't just sex. It's, it's mental, spiritual and adultery. Spiritual, yes. Uh, disallegiance to God really is all it is. is worship the other things besides God. Yes. So it can be very general, even though it sounds specific. Well, what's interesting in verse 21 is, is the Lord says he's giving her space to repent, but she's not going to repent. Yeah. No. And in verse 20, it's clear that this is not a spirit. It may The spirit may be operating in the background, mm -hmm. but this is a woman named Jezebel. Yeah. And that's that's why I brought that up. I'm this like, is a living woman, yeah. not a spirit. So so um, true, but we can address the spirit beside the woman. We can because that spirit is alive and well today. That's what's got a lot of our churches messed up. Mm -hmm. So we need to we need to face it head on. Okay, so my question would be: Is every spirit that seduces people to sexual immorality, immorality called Jezebel or could it be a whole lot of other um, influences doing the same thing and this woman just has to, happens to be called Jezebel and now the church has attached the name Jezebel to anyone male or female yeah, who I acts in this way. Right. I think it's important, like you said earlier, to stay within the parameters of Scripture when we, when we look at it so that we don't rabbit trail and just attach everything to Jezebel because... Well, it, it would be curious to know what the name Jezebel means because every name has a meaning. Yeah. I can't remember. It's, it's in the Bible somewhere. Why don't we look it up? I'm sure, but I don't know where. We should look it up. Yeah. Let's do it real it fast. This is, this is good stuff. I like this. Let me see if I can... Uh, if you guys get there before me, but okay. Okay, it, what I'm looking at here from the definition from the Merriam Webster dictionary, an impudent, shameless, or morally unrestrained woman. Um, shameless, basically. Well, the the Hebrew origin is pure or virginal, so there's a negative or a positive meaning to each name. Okay. Um. Thank you, Jill. Uh. Power hungry, violent, whorish woman is another definition here. Phoenician royal whose identity and name have come to signify a power hungry, violent, and whorish woman. Did you know what her her religion was too? Was Baal. Oh yes. We know all about that. 
that yeah. pagan yeah. demonic yeah. fallen angel. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we start digging into what Jezebel was actually what, what she's all about, um, bowel worship. And that, that controls that whole abortion agenda too, by the way, you know, and the God of Molech, um, where they sacrificed their children in the fire back then. It says the best understanding, understood meaning of the name is where is the Lord? Sorry, can you say that again? The best understood uh, as meaning, the name means where is the Lord? Wow. Where did you get that from? Uh, that's from Anglicized translation of the Hebrew, and this is from the Oxford Guide to People and Places. Okay. Interesting. So you know what? We probably will camp on that again later. Did you have a statement to make, Pastor? Well, I can tell. <laughs> yes, I do. Okay. And um, we've got to look at principalities and powers. Mm -hmm. And if we assign a principality with the name Jezebel, she has other demons that are under her that would do the same thing that she does. So whether it was um, an actual spirit or whether it was the name given to some person that was doing these same things, it all fits kind of in that, in <clears throat> that um, hierarchy. Thank you. So um, it's, not a, it's not unusual for somebody to pick the same name as somebody had, you know, way back when. Yeah. We do it all the time with James and John and Matthew sure. and all that sort of stuff. But um, So I wouldn't get too hung up on whether or not this was an actual person or whether it was a, just a spirit that uh, was affecting the church. It does appear that it's an actual person in this case. That's a mystery, too. It is a mystery. Yeah. And... Um, but it's the spirit that we're that we're really concerning ourselves with the spirit of Jezebel, which causes all this seduction, etc. You know what's interesting to me too is Jesus talks about buying the strong man. Yeah. You know, and it's like you've got to get that that one spirit that's in charge of all these other spirits, find him or whatever that spirit, and get it bound, and then the other ones fall. Um, but. His, his, uh, what's his prescription here for, um, Thyatira? Uh, I'm just going to kind of finish this part off here a little bit. Um, in verse 24, but unto you, I say and unto the rest in Thyatira, as many as have not this doctrine, which have not known the depths of Satan, as they speak, I will put upon you none other burden but that which ye have already hold fast till I come. He that overcometh and keepeth my words unto the end, to him I will give power over the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron as the vessels of a potter. Shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my father? And I will give him the morning, the morning star. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. You know, I was studying on this, these letters too that John wrote to the churches and he, he couldn't physically be there anymore to minister to the churches. He was on that prison. And I was reading that being on that prison was almost as bad as the death penalty. It was really just a horrible place to be. And he couldn't, he couldn't minister to those churches anymore. And imagine being in charge of a church in one of those churches, let's just say this one here, you know, and a letter comes in, just like the, in the Old Testament, where an Old Testament prophet gave the will of the people by God, it was almost like that, because John got the message from Jesus himself, right. they get this letter, and imagine everybody in that congregation, that letter being read to them, every single, all seven churches, and they're like, oh, and do you think they read the rest of the book of Revelation? I'm pretty sure they did. And they, I heard that the Ephesians did repent for a while. I think we talked about that last Sunday, that they did repent for a while. I want to say a couple more things because I, I know we're getting close here. Um, 
this is, we're not to Laodicea yet, but there is a lot of people out there, and I, I understand why they have this problem, because I was one of them for a long time, um, where they don't want to go to church, okay? Like, I, I, I don't, I can't, I don't, I can't find a church, they're all bad, I, I can't go. Look, um, a born-again experience is what you need to go to heaven, but you have to be really careful with your words. Like, I think people are reckless when they say they don't go to church or I don't want to go to church or, or any of that. You want to know why? When you read the evaluation for the Philadelphia church, they get raptured. <coughs> it's a church that gets raptured. So I'm not saying that people that don't go to church can go in the rapture, but what I am saying is be, be careful with your words and don't try to disassociate yourself with a church. You even, I mean, I understand people do online churches and stuff like that. I mean, I'm, I had to do it too, but you know, like if I do believe that we should be physically trying to go to a church and if we can't find one, we got to ask God for help to go to one where he wants us to be because the, I feel like the personal fellowship together is really important besides the online stuff. Because yeah. I don't want to be just all by myself in my house all the time, just chatting with people online. Like, I want to be effective for the community and all that. And in the Philadelphia church, we're not there. I don't want to go there today, but they don't have a lot of strength. But the Lord says, I provided an open door for you. And he takes John up after that, you know? So it's like, um, I just want people online to, to be aware of that. And Jesus did not make a mistake when he created the church. He's the one that created the church, okay? So when people say, I don't need church, well, then you're saying the Lord obviously made a mistake, and we know he doesn't make mistakes. So um, what you got to do, and what I, you know, this just fell into my lap here at church, and I love it, man. I'm really happy that I have a church that I can go to now and exercise whatever God's given me in my gifts. And um, is it is it labor? Is it works? Like sometimes when Jesus says to these churches, I know thy works, it's work. But don't we have to get up and go to work every day? Well, you know, a lot of people look at church as a place to get something. And really, you do get something out of church, but you're also a gift that God made that's unique, that has things to give. Every one of us. And people should think, if I don't go to church, they're missing out because I'm not there. That is rarely thought. And, you know, we have a member here who's who's out riding on the range because, I don't know, he doesn't see value of being here. And yet he's a gift to this church, and he should be here. Yeah. And people should well, think more that way. You know, and I, I think that's where we're just called to have patience with our brethren or or sisters in Christ in that, in that regard and just keep influencing them in the right way. I don't want to be, this is just me personally, like we're all a little different here, okay? But like for me personally, because um, I've had them do that to me in church in the past where, oh, I didn't see you at church. And it was almost like this spirit of like, what do you, you know, get that off of me. Like, I don't need you telling me that my attendance is, needs to be perfect, you know? Mm -hmm. But here, I think we all understand that, that, you know, like church is important and all, but I do know what you're saying. And I think it is really important to just kind of nurture those folks to, to, to do the right thing. And I think with the Lord's help, they will eventually. I think Sandy said it very well, is that we have gifts that we need to be uh, aware of and share with our brethren. And it's, it goes with the second greatest commandment, love your neighbor as yourself, mm -hmm. is that if you have a gift and it'll help somebody on it with their walk with the Lord get to the to the goal of being with the Lord eventually. Then we need to be sharing it, and if we hide it, it's no, it's. it's I agree with Sandy. I'm not we will disagreeing sit, at all. Yeah, we will sit in judgment <clears throat> if we hide those gifts. Yeah, a lot of churches discourage people using their talents because oh, I'm not. You know, it's, it's like a competitive thing. Attention from the current leader or something, and we need to love each other and respect each other as equal partakers yeah, of the blessings of God. And our so our race is for ourselves. Like as far as um, it's not a competitive thing. We should be working together 
as a cohesive unit. And when I stand before the Lord, he's judging my works, not anybody else's. Go ahead. Well, in, you know, Romans 12, 4, it says we have many parts in, one, in the one body. Amen. And all these parts have different functions. In the same way, though, we are many. We are one body in union with Christ, and we are all joined to each other as different parts of one body. So if we're not here giving, doing our part, you know, you cri we're crippled. As a church, that's so, Satan's you know, agenda. He and, is uh, his agenda is so to get us. Two people aren't here. I mean, for <laughs> legitimate, you know, for not legitimate reasons. You're sick, or you're on working, or sure. you know something. But you know, then you, you're without two arms, or without a leg, or you're without a ear, you know, whatever. So I hear you. you know, we can't function if we're not all present as best we can, giving and doing our part, whatever our part is. Right. And this is what people need to hear. They need to hear stuff like this, and so this message is going to go out. Um, you know what I wanted to. You know what I wanted to do, Pastor. On this, I want to close with a prayer. But um, I always like to, and I maybe I'll leave this for your your message if you want to about salvation. I kind of wanted to get a salvation message in, but I think I'd like to just close with a prayer for um, James chapter five about any among you sick, let him call upon the elders. Yeah. Um, so I don't know if you'd like to come up here with me and let's pray over anybody that is sick, anybody in the congregation, so that we could just have a moment of prayer for and anybody online. So if we don't see your message online right away, let us know and I'll, I'll make sure that I look at your comments a little bit later and I'll address it. I'll acknowledge that we prayed for you, okay? So I'm going to let Pastor pray. Do you guys have anything, any sick, anything going on that we need? And Joe, I know that you've got some back pain. Anybody else besides Joe have any, uh, any My usual <coughs> yeah. Okay. How about you, Dale? Dale, are you okay? Uh, I need to drink some water. <laughs> <laughs> There's some water back there, Dale, so just go get it if you need it. It's no problem. Um, what, what can we pray for you about, Dale? <laughs> well, I just, I'm just struggling like the rest of you, so it's great. Anybody else? Yeah. Um, Joe, come on up here. We'll uh, anoint you with some oil. And <laughs> are, you, are you filming this? Yes. We can do it down. If you want to go down there and anoint him, it's fine. And come up here and pray. This is what the church does, ladies and gentlemen. What we do is... We're doing what the function of the church is supposed to do, praying for the sick, laying, the elders laying the hands on the sick, and this is very scriptural and biblical for healing. Maybe even deliverance as well, if people need to be delivered of spiritual infirmities as well. So, um, Pastor? Maybe we should just cut that off. Okay, all right. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and conclude here, ladies and gentlemen, but just to let you know, that if you do need prayer, if you're sick for something or you have a spiritual infirmity, please let me know. I'll check the messages a little bit later. God bless you and thank you for attending this Bible study with me at Stites Baptist Church. God bless you and have a good day.